Hi, everybody. I'm Ann Gentle. This is my colleague, Hart Hoover. And you know, we wanted to talk through what it's like to deploy apps on OpenStack today. And it turns out it's actually a lot of fun. But I thought of something the whole time I was trying to learn all of these things related to cloud deployment. And somehow, it was Anthony Bourdain. So he's a famous uh, chef in, in America. And he's written books and traveled the world. And he tells this great story of the first time he ever worked in a real kitchen. And I tell you what, he was really excited watching everyone cook, seeing how great they were. Their movements were you know, very accurate, and they were completely professional in every way. And he accidentally picked up a burning hot pan and got a blister on his finger. And he goes up to the lead cook and says, do you have a Band-Aid or some salve or something? And the guy was like, what you want, a Band-Aid? And he grabs a searing hot pan, holds it up, puts it back down, and holds up his hand, blisters, red as can be. This guy was not phased. And so that is kind of what happened to me <laughs> <laughs> while I was trying to learn how to deploy apps on OpenStack. You get some cuts, you get some bruises, you put a Band-Aid on, or not, and Wait. you go on. So anyway, that's my little story. But let me talk about who we are, why we're here. Um, we're both technical product managers at Cisco. Um, I started at Cisco about six months ago. And I've always been in documentation community here in OpenStack. So partially, this is about me going from an OpenStack contributor to more of an OpenStack user. So, and at Ann Gentle on Twitter. So go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm Hart Hoover. I uh, am also a technical product manager at Cisco. I've been at Cisco about a year. Um, and before that, I was at Rackspace, where I was a user of OpenStack in public cloud, private cloud, everywhere. So um, the person I can learn here. from. <laughs> yep. And I'm at H Hoover on Twitter. Yep. And we're from Texas. And you say y'all, and I don't really say. I say y'all a lot. I said it <laughs> opening this. I said y'all. You did. I did. Yes. So what are we going to talk about today? So we're going to find out what tools work well for app deployment. Um, how do you get better at this? How do you practice deploying? And then what did we learn, including demos? So you can get the slide deck. Uh, I uploaded it today, slideshare.net slash Gentle. It should be the top one. And um, you can always ask for us at the Cisco stand or even in the Cloud Apps uh, lounge. lounge. We're there, too. So. so what happens when you make the infrastructure boring? I actually think a lot of us have already experienced this. We're like, yes, give me a server already. It's done. And so what happens next? Well, let's play, and let's find out what you can do on OpenStack. So go ahead. Give us some use cases. So some use cases that are common to an OpenStack cloud. There they are. There they are. Sorry. Uh, so what we've seen from our customers and what we've done ourselves, uh, web apps, mobile apps, um, People using OpenStack for different environments, such as like maybe just a dev environment, or they're running in production, or both. Um, they're using OpenStack to manage their testing environment as part of a CI/CD pipeline. Uh, we have e-commerce customers running running their e-commerce environments on OpenStack. We have some media networks uh, and ad networks on OpenStack. We have big data customers. Uh, you really, you name it, right? The OpenStack infrastructure lets you run the gamut of whatever you're trying to do. Your imagination is the limit. Yes, more exactly. So how do you do this? Well, configuration management is a huge part of this. That's how you have repeatable processes that work every time. And there's a lot of options. So we sort of put them into categories. Um, if you want to stay within the OpenStack ecosystem only, then you would use orchestration, which is the heat project and perhaps the application catalog, such as Murano, which are OpenStack projects in the OpenStack community. Now, if you want to use the surrounding ecosystem, you can use Ansible, Chef, Puppet, CloudInit. All of these are maintained outside of OpenStack governance, but very much work on different infrastructure pieces of OpenStack, right? And what we actually want to demonstrate a little bit of today is how you can use those in combination as well. So what if you take an orchestration template and run an Ansible playbook? So I'm very careful not to say Ansible script. That is yeah. inaccurate. So what if you want to make sure it's repeatable? Use a puppet configuration. You may have things already in-house. How useful is that to you, especially if you already have people trained on puppet? 
Well, great, you can just reuse that configuration management knowledge here in the cloud. Oops, I keep going the wrong way, sorry. All right. So what's great about orchestration templates in combination with configuration management is that, uh, like it says up here, orchestration templates can automate networking. So if you have a floating IP private network situation, um, you, you know, it's easier to put that in a template and have everything ready when the instance launches. Uh, you can pass parameters into your application through configuration management, through heat parameters. Uh, and with later releases, heat can control uh, your software deployments uh, for the deployment of your actual app, which we've been waiting for. Yay. <laughs> um, it's great to be able to take a bunch of resources together, combine it with a configuration management platform so that heat takes care of building the raw things that you need, and then configuration management takes care of building the, uh, building the software on that infrastructure. Right. So of course, the next thing you tend to think of with app deployment is containers. So where do containers fit into the OpenStack, you know, the OpenStack community, the OpenStack use case? Um, you can have Docker resources in your orchestration templates, but how many of you have run across that in the, in the greater you know, provider space? Are providers giving us that? We haven't run into a cloud yet that has that. So. Um, and then you can also, and I think this is awesome, is use it, use it locally, but have the orchestration of the containers, like Docker Swarm, running somewhere else, running by other people. And that's even better, because then I don't have to do all of the uh, really heavy lifting on my little MacBook, right? So, because, my, like, seriously, when I, a lot of times when I run Docker images, my little fan goes, so, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, we haven't really um, seen a lot of clouds supporting the Docker resource. The Docker heat heat. resource. So as far as uh, practicing your deployment uh, on an OpenStack cloud, just step one, find an OpenStack cloud. <laughs> Some of the, sometimes this will be a public cloud, like a, a DreamHost or Rackspace. Sometimes this may be a private cloud that your company is providing you, such as a MetaCloud, Mirantis, RPC, uh, type cloud environment. Uh, find the services you want to install. So those, by services, we mean uh, the app itself, right? Your, your code. Um, then, you know, what infrastructure do you need to run that application? So you need to find heat template examples or just heat templates that will deploy that for you if it's a kind of a standard off-the-shelf app. Uh, you need, or if you're going to combine it with a configuration management platform like Ansible, uh, you could look on Ansible Galaxy. Maybe there's some uh, playbooks or roles on there that uh, will deploy that app for you. And finally, play around, try it out, throw it at the wall, see what sticks, and test, 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 sleep, and then test again to make sure it's you know, until it's right. I think I put the sleep in there because like, I really, it took me a long time to wrap my head around each piece and part. So, um, but I think it's important to find like, what's interesting to you. If, if a web app is boring by now, find something else that's more interesting to you. So yep. um, I run, my son has type 1 diabetes. He has a sensor in his arm. I run a, a Pebble app on my watch to monitor his blood glucose. So it's a super personal like, use case, right? Um, so that's, that's what I think you also have to think about when you're trying to figure out how to learn this stuff. So um, now, this was the part that surprised me is not, you know, you have to get credentials, right? So first of all, we found an OpenStack cloud that will give us credentials. Um, also upload a key pair, not a big deal. I think most, you know, developers are gonna have a good sense of that. But the thing that really surprised me was that I didn't realize that different cloud providers, depending on how they made their images, might have different OS usernames. So the operating system username on TriStack tends to be um, Fedora, Ubuntu, CentOS. There are two clouds at Cisco. One uses cloud for all of the image um, operating system username. Another one uses cloud-user for all of the operating systems. And so that was kind of a surprise. And so since I'm you know, cloning GitHub repos that I want to deploy, I actually had to upload a, a GitHub key so that I could authenticate as cloud-user or cloud. And so that just became an extra layer of complexity that I wasn't expecting at all, so. Yeah. 
You also need to find a demo application, right? What do you want to run? Uh, so some of these can be web servers, Apache, Nginx, databases, uh, MySQL is on here, could be a, uh, a uh, uh, MongoDB type, type database. Uh, you could run Etherpad. The point of this is, you know, find something you can show off in your, in your company or to peers that's open source and everyone kind of understands how it works. Um, but, uh, you know, Jekyll and WordPress are on here. Everybody loves to demo WordPress. It was like the, WordPress, the interop demo today was right. WordPress. But it's, it's, a, multi, like, oh, you know, it's a multi tier app. Everyone, everyone, everyone knows, how knows it, works. it by now. I, know. I mean, everyone that's you know, awfully know. Like, elitist Sorry. of us. But <laughs> anyway, I, I also find that you find that people deploy OpenStack because it's truly free open source software. Like, there's a difference between Etherpad and Etherpad Lite. You need, you know, when you're just playing around, you're going to yep. probably deploy Etherpad Lite and kind of and, take what you get, right? Right. And what's yeah. great about demo software, too, that is like this, these examples, is that there's lots of examples out there of other people using heat templates and configuration yep. management that are already, already kind of set up yep. uh, for you to learn with. And so that's what I started doing was like, OK, what's on GitHub that's current, that's recent? Um, are there heat template examples? Um, I, I mean, I'm really lucky to have heart where I can just ask him daily, like, well, what's the latest on this heat template? Or do you think this one would work for us? Or what might stop me from using this one? I mean, I, yeah, I think we did that often, where I was still looking for, why can't I install the right Ruby manager, you know, Ruby version manager? So, but there's also, you know, depending again on what's in your company, Chef Cookbooks, um, Puppet Forge, um, Ansible Galaxy. And so I think I spent some time looking for this magic, you know, incantation that would take care of everything for me. And of course, it's more complicated than that. I had to learn that myself. So um, some of it doesn't exist for a Liberty cloud um, because the projects have moved forward. But we're still doing calls against, you know, solid, rock solid IaaS clouds. And there are so, some clouds out there that are still Ice House. Right. And we're saying that I'm probably and preaching before. to the choir, but yeah, I, I, you know, I think you guys understand that you, you, you have to understand that there could be a couple years distance between the API that you're using and what you can do today. So some things we found while playing around. Uh, you know, which clouds support orchestration? That's, that's a fun thing to run into. Uh, this contrasts kind of well with the interop challenge earlier. Yes. <laughs> um, TriStack, for example. No orchestration service. Um, and the error message is super sad. Like, it has region one in it, and that's meaningless except for like understanding regions. So that just made me go, oh, we need a better error message. <laughs> um, so which, which CLI tool do you use? Uh, are you using the Python Nova client? Are you using the OpenStack client? Um, sometimes, based on your, your role as a user, uh, for example, like admin versus user, the Neutron client may give you better results than the OpenStack client, even though the Neutron client is supposed to be deprecated. Well, and there's a cloud where I have admin access, and I went to list the floating IPs and got everyone's floating IP across all the projects with the OpenStack client, and I, I literally couldn't figure out how to filter it. So finally, it was a Nova command that brought back a filtered list with only the two floating IPs I could get. And there was no like grep for the project ID, no. I mean, I, I really like tried to solve it. Um, and I ended up filing a bug for the OpenStack client because it's, you know, there's admin users everywhere and I cannot look at 200 floating IPs and pick mine out. You also need to, you'll run into which version of OpenStack is this particular cloud running? So, uh, and then within that, which particular version of orchestration is it running? Uh, so which resources does this version or this cloud support in heat? Um, you know, can I use the Docker resource? Can I use things like software config and software deploy to manage my app lifecycle? Um, or is this, this heat version kind of so far back that it doesn't have that yet? Yeah. Yeah. And that's not even mentioning micro reversions where you ask, you know, your cloud, what version are you at? Um, and we're still working on the API documentation for how do you tell someone that the compute to API for Liberty froze at like 2.21 for all microversions, and we don't even have a way to display that in the documentation yet. So 
That's what else we found while playing around. Um, more things we found while playing around. Uh, you go ahead with the orchestration ready images. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, the images that you get from uh, the one I'm most familiar with is just the Ubuntu cloud image. Um, doesn't have heat ready things automatically in it, such as uh, OS underscore collect underscore config. You've got to kind of pre-install those as you go um, and as you deploy. They're not in every image that you run into uh, across clouds. Some clouds will take images from upstream and put that stuff in there knowing their customers are going to want to run heat type stuff, and so they're ready to go, uh, but not every cloud. And then this project called Murano, the application catalog, looks so awesome, and we really want that kind of push button, easy button um, for our users as well, but I haven't seen it on a cloud provider yet, so where is it? And then, yeah, I guess this one's my story because <laughs> I get my entire app deployed and I cannot access Nginx in any way, shape, or form. And I'm SSHing into the server. It's fine, it's fine, Nginx is running, the service is fine. But I launched the instance with the default security group and someone had changed it out from under me, so I had no web traffic whatsoever. So set up your own security group. So you know what traffic is in and out, and no one else can change it on you. Basically the uh, never assume anything. Never assume anything. <laughs> the classic rule that I didn't, yeah, realize until I found out the hard way. So uh, another good lesson learned, we kind of touched on it earlier, uh, containers, you know, it kind of just works. So by that we mean, uh, and I think that's, that's kind of funny just to say that because <laughs> Docker has its own issues, but Right. Uh, as far as just, I want to build a container uh, on my local laptop, I want to make an image out of it and then push it to a swarm uh, that I've built on a cloud somewhere or deploy to a container service, yay. Like, that just works so well. Yeah, and I mean, someone else had already figured out in a Docker image all the Ruby version management that I needed to know, but I couldn't just resolve it with their image without, like, making their image or something, you know, like, some weird workaround. So. That it just took so much less time, though, because the image was, the hard part was done, the image with all the dependencies was done. So um, I also found that I was admin on one cloud and, and, and I, just a plain user on the other, and so that was kind of what I was hinting at with the whole floating IP list debacle. Um, and having to know, am I cloud user or cloud dash user? Um, so that was... It wasn't even, like, I really thought, oh, it's a credential thing. And so you can get even confused by what the message is, is telling you, um, where things just don't work. And it's like, well, of course it's not going to work. Your cloud dash user on this image. You'll never SSH in. And so you end up troubleshooting the SSH, but it's the username every time. So, um, and I also had to do some kind of workarounds, and, and we'll show this in the demo, of uh, what, you know, what, in my configuration management, what user am I acting as? Uh, yeah. And I think this is mine because, <laughs> so here's what I found. I had to learn a lot more Linux than I already had on board <laughs> because at the bottom of all of these was some shell script that I had to make sure worked. So I found out very early on that I needed to understand what was happening in the user data, what was happening in the scripts. Um, I also found out what a terrible typist I am, so I literally found m1.smell in my script. Um, that's supposed to be small. Um, and I also just didn't realize that it, it, it took too much time for me to debug cloud init and the bash script inside of it, plus Ansible and the Ansible syntax plus heat and the heat syntax, and how many spaces do I need to indent this correctly? And is there a YAML parser that will tell me it's okay? And I mean, it was just overwhelming at the end of the day. And so this is actually a true screenshot of the kind of conversations I would have with Hart. Uh, so, you know, I'm launching my second stack. Now I get bad router requests, and I change the cider of the subnet. Nothing else changed. And, you know, so do I have to delete the router and then delete a subnet? And then I would try to delete 
the network, and the network would be like, you can't delete because there's all this stuff connected and ports, ports are connected. And, yeah. So <laughs> it's it, like it took me so long to figure out how to reliably repeat my test case every time. And Hart's just like, you do this over and over, and I'm like, yeah. oh my god, no! Welcome to welcome to debugging. You do it until it works. Yes, yes. <laughs> Take your developer hat, put it on. All right, so you guys want to see some of the things we made while we were playing around? Let's, let's demo this thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yours is first. OK, so um, uh, I made a, a heat uh, template uh, using, that uses Ansible water. Um, to deploy everyone's favorite game, Minecraft. It's mine. Um, so I, uh, because conference Wi-Fi is always terrible, I recorded a video. Um, this is on GitHub in um, Cisco's DevNet uh, organization. So you can see um, I'm passing parameters to Minecraft via Ansible. I'm also passing parameters. Uh, this is heat parameters to my particular cloud um, to use for Minecraft things. So an image, flavor, um, the public network UID I'll use for a floating IP address. Uh, then I'll start making resources, right? So still in the template, make a key, make all my networking stuff, um, all the make sure my floating IP is, is done, create a security group uh, with the right ranges. Finally, it's just a single, single node, nothing super fancy, um, that uses the parameters from earlier. And then it's uh, some, some bash for cloud in it, um, it always to actually bash. install Ansible uh, and Python and such, and then uh, get my Ansible code from GitHub also, and then use the parameters I set in heat to pass to Ansible. Um, so tur turkey out of the oven, hooray, it's done. Um, Cooking show. Yeah, exactly. Shows all the, all the resources, shows all the parameters, including my SSH key. Don't worry, this is long deleted. Oh yeah, we played on uh, that ago. <laughs> um, and then it shows all my parameters, what I actually passed to, uh, to Minecraft, um, and shows the resources here. Each resource has its own UUID, of course. Um, I can click on the server, look at the log, and this is where you can debug your Ansible, make sure it all deployed correctly. Um, then go back to your parameter screen, grab the IP address, throw it into Minecraft, and then play. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, it's night. Yeah, that IP address won't work anymore. Darn yeah. it. It is running. It's just nighttime. <laughs> um, it's nighttime. Uh, but you're full health, and you've it's creative you're not mode. hungry. Creative so, mode. Oh, yeah, creative mode. Yeah, exactly. Because you parameterized it. Awesome. Um, so yeah, that is basically deploying, deploying Minecraft on OpenStack while playing around. We do that at conferences so we can demo interesting things. <laughs> so mine's a little less exciting, but still kind of interesting. So I wanted to be able to run um, something with Ansible, um, but show a little bit of a differentiation from Hart's demo, where I'm running it just with cloud in it and not through a heat template. So I made this uh, Jekyll site. And I've been to all the summits except for the first one. So I have a bunch of photos on Flickr. And so what I wanted to do is be able to deploy a Jekyll site that would then kind of rotate through these uh, photos that I have from different um, summits. So I have, and, and I mean, this is part of the playing around. Like, do I write it with cloud in it, which is one particular syntax? Um, and it's hard to see, I know, but you'll, you can download them later. Or do I run it as a bash script? Um, and it turns out that I was a little better at debugging a CloudInit script. Like, I don't know why, but Bash wasn't always making sense. Um, but I just wanted to show that, you know, it really depends on where your, uh, where your like, knowledge lives, how to run this. Um, and then the Ansible playbook itself was one I found on Git, but then modified for what I was doing um, so that I could uh, then do my own summit example website. So, and my um, video isn't nearly as awesome as this, uh, as Hearts, but, um, oh, I had it for a second. There you go. But basically, what I wanted to show is that I could take this Jekyll site and change something small on it. So in this case, um, it was showing the Hong Kong summit photos, 
but there's a piece of JavaScript in the Jekyll site that lets me change out to a different Flickr album ID. So I'm going to go grab the Paris album ID off of Flickr and see what pictures come up out of that. It will just pick three pictures out of the album and display them online. So it's kind of dull. That's why we fast forwarded very quickly. But basically, I'm just changing out the album ID so that we can get a different album to display. The idea is that once I have this change, I'm going to upload it to GitHub with a git push to the GitHub remote. But um, because I've made this cloud server that also runs something similar to GH Pages, basically, which is a Jekyll site, I can also, from after I merge this pull request, I can do a git push remote staging. And so the staging server is the one running on an OpenStack cloud. And so git push staging, I think I, think I called it Jekyll staging, yep. um, gives me the truly running website in the whole you know, Nginx running with the right ports open and everything else. So check out the gallery. And I can now get, oh, I flipped them. I can do Paris Summit or the Hong Kong Summit. So that's just kind of a, a quick way to show this is a way to, because I, I totally believe in the power of Git for documentation. Like, it's amazing. And so that I can just you know, quickly do a staging server for the tech writers to have um, very easily um, deploying just by basically giving them a cloud init script and a link to an Ansible playbook is incredible to me. So. Um, that's the docs site example. So, all right. Do you want to summarize? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. In summary, <laughs> uh, learn tools for deployment. So that is, um, you know, is that automation um, various for various of yeah, yeah various exactly. tools. Heat, you know, your config management platform, Docker, whatever you want to use. Um, use make sure you're using cloud ready images. So. Uh, Provide, most OS providers, OS maintainers, have cloud-ready images ready to go. Uh, you can easily download them and use them. Um, if you're going to use Heat uh, or a config management platform, uh, parameterize everything you can as much as possible. It will make it easier in the long run when you're testing and eventually deploying and maintaining. Mm -hmm. uh, get the both, best of both worlds. Use uh, infra management and configuration management. A lot of configuration management platforms will manage your infra as well. Um, you know, make sure you're putting those things together and storing them in version control. Uh, and I mean, you know, I, I actually was really impressed with Ansible. Learning Ansible was the most valuable like exercise out of this because I still remember when I was like, I can redeploy this while I'm debugging it. And it was amazing. And he's like, welcome to the dark side. You know, I should have captured that little we have chat. Cookies. Yeah. <laughs> I'm converted. Ansible was amazing to use and gave me that long, you know, log that I could read through and kind of understand what had happened along the way. Um, and so that's I think the the sort of commonality between our two demos, but also to, you know, show that you can launch it in, in different ways and uh, keep, you know, keep the configuration management like strong, sturdy on top of your infrastructure. So. And both of the demos are on GitHub. And both the demos are on GitHub. Um, GitHub.com slash Cisco DevNet. And you can find um, MetaCloud uh, samples. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we've also written these up as um, learning labs. And so that actually shows you step by step how we did each of these um, so that you could take your credentials from any OpenStack cloud, and you should be able to run these because of you know, the Ansible commonality. So, And that's a half hour of prepared things. Do you guys want to ask us anything, or do you have any questions? Rant and rave. <laughs> Talk about your typos. <laughs> In one smell. <laughs> In one smell. Huh? OK. Well, cool. Uh, come find us at the Cisco booth, A25. Yep. Come get stickers. Yep, we have stickers. Um, thank you for coming.